Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, uh, let me thank the organizers for this uh, opportunity to present this talk. Uh, it's a, uh, aimed as, a, as an introduction, and uh, I plan to start more or less from uh, scratch. I mean, you know, uh, all of you have, are exposed to a lot of geometry. There'll be some geometry, and then switching over to uh, some special aspects, and uh, then uh, some applications to dive into approximation, as the title indicates. Yeah, so my apologies to uh, those who might uh, find this uh, like chicken feed or something uh, that I already knew. So sorry for that. Uh, we start with, uh, so I'll be denoting by H the uh, Tonkare hyperbolic plane. And you will recall that this is uh, equal to complex numbers with positive imaginary part. <coughs> OK, and uh, you all know that this is equipped with, if I write z as equal to x plus iy, then this is the Poincare metric. Poincare metric, and it's given by dx squared plus dy squared by y squared. Oh, it's small. It's too small. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to write uh, still bigger. So uh, so far, I'm sure uh, these are uh, very familiar things. So you can recognize even in small print. So <coughs> uh, yeah. So it's a geometric object that you are you would now be familiar with. Let me also recall a few more things about uh, this. The geodesics in this geodesics in H. So they are either uh, semicircles or uh, semicircles with endpoints on R. R or vertical vertical lines. So this is one type, and that's another type. And they're uh, really not re uh, different, as you all know, because if you think of the point at infinity as uh, uh, a part of the boundary, then these are also the circles. Circles ending from starting with a, from a real point and uh, ending at infinity. OK, so uh, as we saw, this sort of uh, R union, so uh, the, the, here it's a visual boundary, but it's a boundary in various technical senses, as you, uh, you would have uh, been introduced, exposed to some time or other. So uh, boundary of H is, uh, this is just R union infinity. And one sense that you see already in uh, this being the boundary is that your geodesics are ending at these points. So it is starting and ending points. Are, so it's, it's a certain natural boundary for uh, the hyperbolic plane. We'll not go more into the technical significance of that at this point, at least. So <clears throat> I just want to recall some of the things uh, to set up the framework. Apart from this, we would like to know about uh, isometries. Isometries of H. Now, uh, again, you might all recall that uh, uh, for any G in SL2R, uh, G equal to A, B, C, D, we have 
uh, the action on H by Z going to AZ plus B upon CZ plus D. Now this takes any complex number to any uh, complex number or infinity that is uh, clear. And uh, uh, because the determinant is one, you will see that uh, when it is not infinity, it's actually a point of the upper half plane if you start with a point in the upper half plane. So <coughs> uh, this map of C union infinity leaves H union infinity invariant and uh, more importantly for us and the action is by action is by isometries. I suppose most of you, uh, maybe all of you would know it already, but uh, if not, you can just check it. I'll not go into the detail. You can believe that, uh, that this is actually, these are actually isometries of, uh, so uh, now it will uh, also be convenient to introduce at this point certain specific kinds of isometries which will play, uh, which will sort of serve as a coordinate system and also play uh, some role in the later part. So subgroups of uh, sometime or other I have to point out that the identity, uh, the minus identity acts trivially. So this action can be thought of either as the action of SL2R or also uh, SL2R modulo plus or minus identity. We'll uh, I'll make a formal note of that at a, at a different point. So subgroups of, and we'll sort of uh, use SL2R and PSL2R interchangeably. So subgroups of SL2R uh, uh, that, uh, so they, they, they'll be subgroups consisting of isometries. Let, let me introduce some notation, K equal to, cos theta uh, minus sin theta, sin theta cos theta, theta in R, which anyway you need to look modulo 2 pi. These are obviously elements of uh, SL2R. Then I'll have like e power t by 2, 0, 0, e power minus t by 2. There's a reason for, uh, why I introduced t by 2 rather than t, which you will see shortly. Though the subgroup, as subgroups, there's, there's the same, no matter what constant you, uh, constant you write there. And uh, <coughs> n equal to one S zero one S in R. Now, uh, those of you who have some familiarity with Lie groups, you'll uh, realize why this notation, why, why the uh, symbols and uh, it's actually the uh, USR decomposition. But I want to view this, uh, point this out to you that this serves as a coordinate system on uh, the uh, hyperbolic plane here. So observations, observations. So uh, K fixes or uh, K fixes the point I, that is K on I equals I for all K in K. This is a matter of simple verification. I'll uh, uh, leave it to you in case you have not already seen it. Then uh, A, so let me call this uh, A T and uh, 
and S. <coughs> so a T in A takes I to e power T I. That was the reason why I introduced uh, T by 2 there. So if you look at uh, B and C are 0, this is Z is I e power t by 2 divided by e power minus t by 2 which is e power, e power t times i. Okay, so let's uh, draw the picture alongside yeah, the point i. The elements of this subgroup, they fix the point i. Then a t takes you along this vertical line and uh, going all the way to from 0 to infinity. Right, and ns in n takes e power t i to s plus e power t i, and this covers the hyperbolic plane. <coughs> so, which covers all of h as we run over S and T. So in particular, you see that uh, in particular, so see that SL2R acts transitively on H. So at this point, let me uh, also uh, plus or minus identity fixes, fixes uh, all Z in H to H and, uh, and it is the only element 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 fixing all z in h this is very straightforward so this this tells tells you that thus you can thus uh, h can be thought of thus h equals uh, Okay, SL2R modulo the stabilizer of any point which is, and I can take K is it, uh, as the stabilizer, K is the stabilizer, uh, should say, and in fact uh, K fixes this and uh, in fact moreover Uh, if I take elements of SL2R which fix I, this is in fact equal to K. And it is also equal to, in the light of this, I can also think of this as PSL2R modulo. K, where now you can think of K as the as uh, that K modulo plus or minus identity. We will sort of often uh, mix these things. It, uh, I don't think that should bother you so much. Okay. Now uh, the action of, of uh, SL2R, uh, SL2R or PSL2R on uh, the, on the hyperbolic plane induces also an action on the tangent uh, bundle, right? And we will be interested in looking at let S1 H be the unit tangent bundle bundle over 
H. So you can think of it as Z, Xi, where Z is in H and uh, Xi is in the tangent space at Z. Uh, I'll write S1, Z. It is the space of unit tangents at Z. Actually, you can have a glo uh, global parameterization. It doesn't matter. But anyway, you can, o you can also think of it as a point together with a direction, unit direction at every point of the etc. Right? And then the uh, action of, let me call this, uh, let, OK, let me not have any notation for that. The action of <coughs> of SL2R, respectively PSL2R, induces induces an action on S1H, right? Why? Because uh, with uh, each of these are they are smooth maps, so they they will take tangents to tangents, and because the maps are isometries, they will take unit tangents to unit tangents. So uh, thus you get and get uh, induces an action, and uh, one observation that I would like to recall here is that the action action is transitive. That is, uh, <coughs> OK, so it, which means if you're given any uh, point and a unit vector there, uh, if you fix this, then there's always there's some element which will take you from there to any other point with, a, with any, uh, any unit direction at that point. So uh, and uh, it suffices to suffices to see that <coughs> k acts transitively on the set of of unit tangents. tangents at i. Why is that? Here I have my point i. So any uh, given any point, I can first bring it by an element of SL2R to this point. So uh, if you are given this pop, a point uh, z and a direction xi, by an isometry, I can bring this point z to the point i. At this point, uh, maybe different ones could go to different uh, directions, but I know a set group, the group of isometries which fix the point that is k, and if that acts transitively on this set of directions, then I will know that it is acting transitively on uh, the unit tangent bundle. Okay, so I, with that uh, observation, I leave it to you to uh, those of you who are not. Uh, familiar with it yet to just to see the uh, check that that that's the case so this suffices so uh, therefore so now I can I can uh, hence modulo uh, some topological understanding uh, that I'll assume so s1h is uh, is canonically equivalent to, say, SL2R modulo uh, a subgroup here. Uh, <coughs> let me temporarily call it, uh, say, J, where J is equal to 
G in G such that G I equal to I and G of we take this as the vertical direction. I, let me call. Let me, I'll use this notation more often. So this is my vertical direction equal to. So in the unit tangent bundle, I fix this as my reference point, i with unit direction pointing upward at infinity. And uh, so uh, I just have to look at SL2R modulo, uh, these identifications. And uh, it's straightforward to see that this is just plus or minus identity. So <coughs> uh, this condition means that G must be in K. And uh, if that element, uh, an element of k is to fix the vertical direction, it has to be simply plus or minus identity. OK, so uh, this geometric object of the unit tangent bundle, we are, we are, now, we are now able to think of pu uh, purely as uh, this. So uh, you know, from the next another step, let me write down. This is uh, canonically equivalent to PSL2R. R, which is same as SL2R modulo plus or minus identity. Okay, so uh, now having this identification, we would like to look at uh, the uh, what happens to the geodesics, and as you all know, there is a uh, there's some dynamics associated with the geodesic flow, uh, a geodesic, and that is the geodesic flow. And uh, we'll go to flow. Now let me quickly recall what, uh, for any Riemannian manifold, I mean, the, your, uh, the idea of uh, geodesic flow is, uh, I'll, I'll not write it in too much detail, you, see, you take a point, and then and a uh, direction, say z xi. Then the geodesic flow prescribes that you start from this point in this direction, and there, so there's a certain geodesic. In this case, it is actually a. We know what it is. It's a semicircle. There's a unique uh, semicircle which will will pass through this point and uh, be in this direction. So uh, you will have this. Geodesic, you, you follow it for time t, it's a unit speed geodesic, you follow it for time t, you get a point zt, you get a point here, which we call Z, uh, zt, and at this point, the flow, uh, the geodesic is directed in, in a particular direction, and that you take as zeta t. And now your flow is something which will, we should take gamma t of z, uh, the geodesic at, at time t starting with uh, this point z naught. Okay, I'll write this as uh, z xi equals z t xi t, and in this way. So that gives you a flow uh, on, on the hyperbolic plane in this case. So now, uh, in terms of uh, this representation or identification, etc., it's very easy to write uh, what this actually does. So, and here is my next observation. Uh, with respect to to the identification. identification of S1H. Notice that the geodesic flow is something that is defined on S1H with, with PSL2R. The geodesic flow is given by given by, so each thing now corresponds to G in PSL2R. Uh, 
you are this going to <coughs> g a t uh, g a t okay this is in sl 2 r now a t was introduced as an element of sl 2 r but as i said i'm going to use the notation interchangeably where a t actually means a t is identified here with a t together with the subgroup plus or minus which i denoted by j if you like so <coughs> Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is that uh, for doing doing this flow is the same as looking at this flow on, on PSL2R. You take G to GAT for for time t. Why is that? To <coughs> so so here. Let me uh, note. It suffices. suffices to see that the identity element which actually which corresponds to i with the vertical direction is moved under uh, moved after time t to a t okay then if this holds if they were one once you know this then you know that the group is acting isometrically then then since the g action uh, then the since the ac action of esl2r is by isometries isometries we get that that g must go to g a t so <coughs> you have the element e going to e going to uh, a t so that the corresponding geodesic goes from uh, so here i want to claim that i vertical at time, after time t will go to uh, a t on i in the vertical direction which is obvious and this is e power t i now once i know this because the action is by isometries I know what happens to all any any given isometry. Uh, <coughs> so uh, by operation of this isometry, I see, uh, various isometries, I see that G G must go to G A T. So the geodesic flow, therefore, with this under this realization, is simply given by action of this subgroup. <coughs> the uh, thus the geodesic flow flow uh, is given by well i'm essentially repeating what i said but i want to introduce this perspective given by the action of the one parameter subgroup meter subgroup bigger oh uh, sorry the geodesic flow is given by the action of the one parameter subgroup a t which is which we also called a but we should keep in mind the parameter t to say that uh, it's a one parameter subgroup one parameter subgroup here means that uh, a s composed with a t equals a s plus t <coughs> for all s t 
Okay, so <coughs> uh, good. So we are now uh, the geomet geometric framework of the hyperbolic plane. Then we have the you know it's isometries, and then the geodesic flow we have identified with a with an object. You want a question? Yes, that's a good point. As uh, uh, it's pointed out here, I have written G going to G A T, and order is important. It is not, as you know, the matrix multiplication is in SL two R is not commutative. So this element is not uh, in general ATG. So the action is G going to AT, uh, AT, <coughs> uh, GAT, uh, I mean a multiplication, uh, multiplication by AT on the right. <coughs> uh, you can also have a left-handed formulation for this, but this is more convenient because uh, it's in this formulation that uh, we can use that Z going to AZ plus B by CZ plus D uh, formulation because the isometries here you see as acting on the left hand side and the geodesic action has necessarily to be from the other side. As far as the uh, group picture is concerned. <coughs> okay, now uh, let's go to so, uh, uh, well, it's all a very simple minded picture now. The, I mean, the, on the hyperbolic plane, uh, things are sort of moving uh, you know, in, in uh, very nice foliations and so on. And uh, starting from one end to go, going to the other, uh, from uh, neither from the point of, dynam uh, point of view of dynamics, uh, nor from uh, the Fintan approximation issues that uh, we are going to deal with. Uh, this is uh, this is going to lead uh, lead to much uh, anything much more. So now the next crucial thing is that we are going to look at this picture modulo groups of isometries, discrete groups of isometries. So now let's first uh, recall recall that any any surface. Surface of constant negative curvature negative curvature can be realized can be realized as you can write it as express it as H modulo gamma where where gamma is a group of gamma is a discrete group of isometries in terms of uh, geometry one should talk of properly discontinuous groups of isometries, but in this case, the group of isometries comes naturally uh, with a topology which, uh, which is a very familiar topology, and in that, it's exactly equivalent to saying that the group is discrete. So, you, uh, <coughs> every surface, I mean, uh, I'm not going to more into the geometric aspects of this, I suppose uh, all of you would know this, and uh, if not, you can believe it and then uh, learn about it learn more about it independently. Okay, so, but every surface of constant negative curvature can be uh, written in this way. Uh, now, there's a little more uh, sort of somewhat technical observation that I want to make. So, these subgroups are, these subgroups, gamma are torsion free. Uh, that is means that there are there is no are no non trivial elements elements of finite order <coughs> but then in our study we don't need to restrict we shall however we shall consider 
also discrete groups with groups with with torsion allowing torsion so <coughs> And now in that in this ca case, what will happen is uh, what they call you will you will uh, get singular points on the quotient, which is the, this quotient is a surface typically. But uh, when there is a when there are uh, torsion elements, the surface will have singularities. And this is just uh, I recall by way of general information. Uh, I'll not go any more into that. Okay, so and the reason for re emphasizing that we are going to take uh, uh, element torsion elements also is that the key example that we want to focus on, in fact, does have torsion. So, key example example, and this is the uh, SL. To Z is a natural discrete subgroup in the group SL2R, where you simply take restrict the entries to integers. So, and this is called the modular. The name comes from its uh, connection with number theory, and will not uh, and learn the labor on that. The modular. Okay, so this is the this is the subgroup in, uh, which, uh, which uh, will be concerned for the most most of the time. And uh, note, it was uh, remarked in Anish's lecture that note that uh, H so for gamma equal to SL to Z, this quotient H modulo gamma is not compact. So, uh, for, su for surfaces of constant negative curvature which are compact, this quotient will also turn out to be, uh, I mean, the, the, this quotient is, is compact. But SL2Z is not one of them. Uh, rather than giving a proof here, I'll uh, defer it. Uh, I mean, it will become obvious at a, a little later. So, it, the, in this case, H mod gamma is not compact, and uh, that that like, that's sort of important uh, to keep to keep in mind in the context of uh, Dapinton approximation, etc. Okay. <coughs> uh, now, for uh, to study the quotient, once you have a group, and uh, to realize that, uh, no, 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 uh, and this has nothing to do with the group. For to study uh, quotients of the surfaces, to, to flow on quotients, one of the important concepts is that of a fundamental domain. Fundamental. Domains. So let uh, gamma be a discrete subgroup of of PSL two R, and uh, I'll henceforth write uh, G for PSL two R. <coughs> By a fundamental domain domain for the gamma action on on H, we mean a subset. F satisfying the following uh, 
following. So firstly, I would like it to be a closed subset. F is a closed subset. There are certain contexts when uh, this is removed, but in, uh, in major theoretic setup, but uh, we'll, we'll not have any reason to do that. Secondly, so we are looking for a subset of uh, H of some kind, which should be closed. And if I take gamma F and take the union over gamma, gamma in gamma, that should be the whole of H. And finally, finally, uh, there should be some kind of uh, irredundancy, and that's the following. So, gamma F intersection F is, I'll first make a vague statement, negligible. What is important is that it should be, uh, should be negligible in some sense, and we'll typically take it to be, uh, uh, sometimes uh, people assume uh, that it should have measure zero, but I think in a geometric context, you should simply uh, say is, uh, uh, has, is nowhere dense. A closed subset and it has no interior point is what uh, we'll think of as negligible. Actually, we'll be coming to very specific fundamental domains, but uh, that's the general idea. Now, what, what, what does uh, such a subset do? So, if you have, uh, it's a closed subset and you have a discrete group, you take its images under uh, various elements, they, all, they cover the whole of the plane, and on the other hand, uh, there, there, there's, there's no there's no serious overlap when you take uh, <clears throat> so uh, this this third thing also implies that uh, three implies also that gamma f intersection gamma dash f is negligible for all gamma gamma prime in gamma because I can simply take out uh, this is equal to gamma on uh, F intersection gamma inverse gamma dash F and negligible sets when operated by an isometry will remain negligible. So, <coughs> okay, so uh, such a set, the nice thing about such a set is that rather than thinking about the whole space, uh, uh, isometries on the whole space, you can sort of restrict to uh, this set and try to understand the action of the flow. Now, uh, again, something I'll re recall that's very standard in geometry and you might would be familiar is uh, Dirichlet fundamental domain. Dirichlet fundamental domain, which tells you a standard routine way of uh, getting such a domain. So, let gamma be a discrete subgroup, subgroup. Now, it's easy to see, and it's a simple exercise uh, that, uh, okay, so, uh, and let P be a point, be a point not fixed by, fixed by any non-trivial element of gamma, non-trivial element of, of gamma. And uh, it's a simple exercise to see that uh, such such point. In fact, uh, almost all, uh, except for a countable set of points, uh, this, this will be uh, fulfilled, because 
any uh, first of all you can check that for any element of gamma any element of sl2r in fact the set of fixed points is uh, is uh, at most consists of at most two points and we, now we have only countably many uh, isometries to consider and so there is only a countably many points that are possible uh, that need to be avoided so surely you have such a thing and now define uh, let d gamma this is with respect to p and that's equal to look at the set of those z in h such that the distance of z from p is less than or equal to distance of z from gamma p <coughs> okay so what am i doing you have i have a yeah, hyperbolic plane i have a certain point p here and then there is the orbit under gamma and uh, it's a discrete subset so what we are doing is that for each point z uh, ask whether p is the point closest to this uh, close uh, it's closer to p than any other point any of the other of these points and uh, define this set and it is fairly straightforward to check that uh, then then d gamma p is a fundamental domain fundamental domain for the gamma action and in fact uh, this has the this has nice properties uh, that uh, it's in fact so uh, when, when we assume a little more about uh, gamma it will have a nice property that uh, the boundary is in fact given by uh, geodesics <coughs> okay so that's about, uh, about generalities now uh, i want to recall one more thing that is the, the fundamental domain of uh, my i'll state it in the form of a proposition so <clears throat> let f equal to z in c uh, z in h such that uh real part of z is between minus half and half and mod of absolute value of z is greater than or equal to 1 so <clears throat> this is a diagram uh, i think uh, to leave us set aside the diagrams from euclidean geometry this is perhaps the most frequently drawn figure this is the real part z equal to minus half real part z equal to plus half this is mod z equal to 1 and i'm drawing this particular this region and we want to say that uh, then uh, f is a fundamental domain fundamental domain for uh, the modular modular group <laughs> okay uh proof of that I'll, I'll yeah i'll go over the proof of this i think it's something uh, sort of fundamental to uh what we're going to do <coughs> proof uh let z in h be given so you have some z somewhere in the 
plane and you want to find an element, uh, find a representative inside this thing, inside this set. <coughs> okay, so uh, look at the uh, so first claim that for any m, any m greater than 0, the <coughs> uh, set of uh, for any set, the, uh, there are only. So, uh, what, what I want to say is that uh, the set, okay, the say, uh, uh, okay, uh, let me pictorially first describe pictorially uh, and uh, <coughs> given this orbit, we want to say that, that, uh, that there's a <coughs> maximum for uh, the set of, the, uh, <coughs> ma maximum for the imaginary parts of uh, gamma of z, so <coughs> uh, T greater than M such that uh, imaginary part of gamma Z equal to T is finite. <coughs> the set, pos possible imaginary parts of uh, elements of gamma z this is this is finite because uh, okay uh, why is this so let gamma equal to a b c d then gamma z we we'll go to the next board gamma z which is equal to a z plus b upon Cz plus D. This I can write as <coughs> so uh, a, a z, a, a z plus B C Z bar plus D and C Z plus D absolute value squared. And you can check that that part because of the determinant condition, it's actually imaginary part of Z divided by C Z plus d whole squared. <coughs> okay, so now, uh, no. so this implies that imaginary part of gamma z is equal to imaginary part of z. So th this will have some real part which is uh, has a little complicated expression, but the imaginary part because of the determinant being 1 is actually imaginary part of z divided by uh, cz plus d squared. Okay, so now uh, <coughs> Cz plus D, now, uh, if imaginary part of gamma Z, uh, I'm given that this is uh, greater than M, which means that uh, hence, uh, so C Cz plus Cz plus D, this implies Cz plus D, is uh, less than imaginary part of z divided by m. Okay, uh, cz squared. Now, uh, but this is equal to cx plus uh, cx plus uh, d squared plus c squared y squared and this expression is less than m imaginary part of z divided by m so firstly you see that uh, there can be only finitely many possible integers c for which this holds implies c firstly that uh, c uh, is uh, has 
is bounded. So, or C has only finitely many many possibilities. Sorry. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Uh, and once, <coughs> this is an integer, and this has to be less than uh, this uh, the right hand side. Therefore, C has only finitely many possibilities. And once you observe that, then uh, for each C, you look, you see that. Secondly, you get that the expression then implies that D has. So for each choice of C, choice. Of C, D has only finitely many possibilities. Many possibilities. Okay, so all in all, it tells you something about the uh, orbit other apart from uh, just the wording there. Geometrically, what it tells you is that you have a point here, you take its orbit, and then uh, these, so on each, at each level, you can see that there, there's a whole uh, string of values, because once, uh, if, uh, if one of the, uh, if this is in uh, the orbit of, this is of the form gamma z, then this plus one will also be in the gamma z because uh, not recall that in case you do not notice uh, this acting on z is actually equal to z uh, z plus one for all z. So points on on each uh, horizontal line, points at a distance one are identified. Under uh, the uh, are uh, belong to the same orbit. So start, if you take a point Z and look at its orbit, so and if, if you look at those lines which are going to contain the orbits, they don't extend to infinity. There is a certain maximum above. Us. If you pick any particular level, there are only finitely many levels above that which contain points of the orbit. So that, therefore, that tells you that there is a certain maximum. Hence. There exists gamma naught in gamma such that such that imaginary part of gamma z is less than or equal to imaginary part of gamma naught z for all gamma in gamma for all gamma in gamma. Okay, so let's say this is uh, my gamma, and here is uh, some gamma not z, and everything is under this level. Okay, so uh, now I have uh, somewhere my fundamental domain sitting like that. Now, uh, whatever, uh, wherever I obtain this point on on this horizontal line. I can apply a suitable uh, this element a suitable number of times, either on the positive or, or negative side, and get a point in which is uh, between uh, minus half and ha half in real part. So we may assume we may assume uh, by application of application of 1 k 0 1 and this k in z that gamma naught z is like uh, the real part of gamma naught z is less than or equal to half. 
Okay, now I claim that uh, this is in fact, uh, so a priori maybe uh, I drew the level above, but maybe a priori uh, it could be way below and uh, the point you obtained may be somewhere here. I say that this is not possible. Uh, now claim, notice that this we have already, uh, you been, uh, one of the formal conditions there is, is fulfilled. Now I want to claim that in fact gamma naught z should be greater than one. So then it will show that this implies that gamma naught z is in F. Uh, so suppose not, suppose not. Now let's look at, uh, uh, let w equal to 0, 1, minus 1, 0, the uh, permutation with, uh, with the sign adjusted to make the determinant to be 1. And uh, so this uh, wz is equal to minus 1 over z. Now apply this to, so thus w of gamma naught z, so the, notice that this is actually in PSL to z. w of gamma naught z, this is equal to, <coughs> uh, now what is the imaginary part of this? Consider, consider this. And uh, the imaginary part of imaginary part of W uh, gamma naught Z is equal to minus one over imaginary part of minus one over gamma naught Z and <coughs> So if you recall the, uh, so uh, that that will be equal to Im imaginary part of gamma naught z divided by gamma naught z squared. Uh, modulo some sign adjustment. So, but this is uh, is less than <coughs> we are we are we are given we are we are assuming that uh, this is greater than one in absolute value. So that means it will give me that this is less than uh, yeah. Uh, no, what am I doing? Imaginary part of. Uh, no, uh, we we want to prove that uh, this is greater than one. So suppose not. Uh, so it, this is this is actually less than or equal to one, and uh, therefore <coughs> less than or equal to one. Therefore, this is bigger bigger than or equal to. Am I, uh, should I pay? can I? No, uh, I need to only uh, show that this is actually greater than or equal to one. And if I, uh, so if gamma naught z is less than one, we get, we get w gamma, imaginary part of w gamma naught z to be greater than imaginary part of gamma naught z, which is a contradiction. It's a contradiction and therefore, hence, gamma naught z is in F. So we have found for every element uh, from the plane, we have found an element, uh, found uh, representative in, in uh, this thing. And uh, Maybe uh, I should not spend more time. Let me, uh, <coughs> the, uh, now the remaining part is what are the identification, uh, uh, what happens when, when we translate uh, the, the, to get the second condition. I'll not go into the detail like, to save time. The only identifications, it turns out, are uh, 
the uh, points at the same level are identified. Then these are identified with this, and uh, uh, yeah, so in this level, and this point remains uh, by itself. So the uh, therefore the <coughs> intersections. The uh, so when I translate this, okay, the, I get there's the next disk here, and so the intersection on this side is this intersection on this side is this, etc. So the uh, intersections being neg negligible can is. Uh, uh, comes out automatically from, uh, uh, I mean, with some with some computation, which I'll skip. <laughs> okay, so the uh, way we are going to use this picture is not actually not. Uh, let me uh, make some observations, which will uh, which sort of uh, motivate what we're, what I'm going to continue into the next time, and that's which is sort of the gist of uh, the. Uh, uh, the talk. So, <coughs> yeah, so here now for the modular group, we have, uh, let me draw the picture again. Etc. So you have, so we, we are interested in what happens to the geodesic flow. So let's say I have, uh, uh, so there is a certain geodesic which I want to, so th this is my zero and this is F. Now if I take, uh, let's say a geodesic like this, my flow is going to go uh, in the concurrent plane, the lifted part is going to go along this. So therefore, when I look at the quotient, the quotient now is uh, is this triangle with these identifications, and that's the thing that I should understand where, how it moves inside inside uh, this thing. So when it when the flow comes here, uh, I mean let's start monitoring it when it, when it is here. Then it goes here. It is so it's equivalent to this. Uh, then maybe it's. Uh, it, that's too much curve shown here. Then this is equal to this, etc. So that that's in in the quotient. So the quotient space is this hyperbolic triangle with the with the identifications, and the flow is uh, crossing that. And we'll be interested in what uh, the behavior of this flow and. Uh, with the kind of with what is the input that you have, you have these two endpoints which are the input, and that gives you a certain full trajectory, and then you want you are interested in looking at how the trajectory looks in the quotient. Okay, so now uh, <coughs> uh, and the two uh, two point input is has to do, is will be relevant in when we discuss the quadratic forms, which I'll do next uh, time. Uh, to, uh, tomorrow, and the thing that uh, a few things I'll uh, point out here to begin with is that uh, actually we will not be uh, restricting to this triangle, but let's look at the whole picture. So you, you have this full continuation on either side, and think of uh, ignore everything else I, I wish I had. I have a, yeah, there is a color chalk here. Let's just think of this, this infinite uh, sort of cutoff level here. Now I want to I want to look at uh, the geodesic flow in the following way. Well, here it will be passing through various uh, things at some point, but then it reaches here. That's the point I sort of stop and make make into one segment. So this is my first segment here. This thing, uh, by our identification, we know that is that it is the same as this point here, and uh, it is <coughs> going. Uh, here in the picture, you see going in this way, but this thing, this is the same as 
the opposite uh, yeah so am i could be either this or this one one uh, the, <coughs> so uh, you, you apply uh, there's this segment going to uh, to infin to the boundary and you apply z going to minus 1 over z and you have a, a direction from here and then the uh, flow the, you get from there you get a, so at in a at in a generic level you will get keep getting segments which uh, uh, <coughs> which are over this so all the geodesics can be segmented in this fashion and this tells you a variety of things so first of all notice that this is, these thing guys are simply wrapping around this so if first uh, one of the simplest questions is is the image some uh, in the quotient is it whether it is bounded and for instance it, uh, that's equivalent to saying that whether the, uh, the geodes, all these segments are under this level now the uh, emphasis will be on that you can actually compute these segments in uh, the uh, uh, heights and uh, lengths of these segments in terms of uh, the continued fraction expansions of the endpoints here. Okay, so uh, first of all, you see that uh, if all these segments are such that the corresponding su successive differences are uh, are bounded by a certain number, then that would mean that there is a certain uh, level, horizontal level beyond uh, which is beyond which you don't go, and you see that that uh, that will mean that uh, it's actually bounded. And then similarly. Uh, the uh, actual positions of, uh, of I mean, the sequence of, so the, uh, for each starting point and uh, geodesic here with, that we took, there's a certain uh, sequence of points which gave, uh, which is associated with that, and the, that sequence is, is going to tell you a lot more about uh, the behavior of, uh, uh, of the geodesic, and correspondingly, uh, since we will be associating it with various quadratic forms, that will give you, give you information about the quadratic form. I think maybe we'll uh, continue this discussion tomorrow. How does this fundamental domain hmm. translate in various contexts? I mean, these are uh, some of the translation ones that will cover like the upper part of the plane. What about how, how do we, uh, what kind of transformations will cover the lower part? Uh, that's in fact the point. If you have to uh, take uh, all the way down, that, that, that becomes messy and complicated. So you want to reduce the study to uh, understanding things just above. That's why you make the whole geodesic into segments which you can see above. Yeah. Anybody else? If not, let's 